What makes the song so hard? I can't make the song brown. The Stallion Part 1, the first entry in Ween's horse-centric musical pentalogy, is either one of the band's worst songs or one of their best, depending on who you ask. If you're wondering where this one ranks for me personally, well, like the last song discussed, I wouldn't call this a favorite of mine, not by a long shot, but I do like it quite a bit. Which is interesting since, depending on the day, this would probably rank as either my third or fourth favorite track in the Stallion canon, with parts 3 and 5 being above it, and 4 and 2 being below it. That may be slightly unfair though. See, of the five Stallion parts, only the first three appear on studio albums. Well, studio albums. Parts four and five, I pretty much exclusively listen to the All Request Live versions, which of course sound oh so good. I've certainly done so a ton for the first three as well, but I also regularly listen to them as they appear on the Pod and Pure Guava, which of course don't sound as pristine. Not that that's the goal with this track by any means, of course, but enough about all that. I mean, this is called What Makes This Song Brown, not What Makes This Song Better Than The Stallion Part 2. And oh boy, if you thought the first song I discussed wasn't brown enough to live up to the video title, then this one should not disappoint. When I think of the concept of brown as defined by Ween, this track is what I immediately think of. So let's take a closer look at what makes this thing tick. So the harmonic structure, um, accompaniment, noise that is featured on this track is extremely dissonant. Okay, I kid, the song isn't just noise, and the musical elements that are at play here are really cool. Like I said, it's extremely dissonant, with tritones and chromatic chord shifts galore. There's three parts. The first features a prominent bass line that utilizes high notes, which at some point sound like harmonics. The second section features a more constant rhythmic motif, which adds a sense of urgency. I find that this helps in keeping the pace of the song refreshing and prevents it from feeling too meandering. There is technically a fourth section as well, but it's pretty much the same as this second part, only the chords modulate up a fifth. It works in that it ratchets up the excitement in the composition, but it's so distorted and nearly incomprehensible on the record, it's hard to tell the difference at points unless you keep an ear out for the bass, which to be fair, is quite loud. This part also complicates things, since while the song mostly drones over an E pedal tone, the chromatic chord changes on A, the 4, and then back to E, with the bass even at one point playing the thirds of those chords, thus inverting them, keep you guessing where it's going to go next, even though it still basically fits the key. So it's not so much tonally ambiguous as it is... kooky. The third part, which is not repeated, is likely the most melodic part of the song. The guitar and vocals work in tandem, kind of, with a more steady quarter note rhythm over top of the same drum groove as the first section. The percussion throughout leaves lots of empty space, which allows for the artificial kick, clap, and tambourine hits to be much more effective. Very smart choice to get the most out of the drum machine. The vocals are completely unhinged. They're very shouty and also feel straight up invasive, like a member of Boognish's Witness or something coming to your doorstep, or in this case your eardrum, relentlessly informing you of his hooved status while also just bluntly insulting you. Squawky is another apt descriptor, I'd say. And yet, in spite of all this, I don't mind these. I tolerate these vocals. I just find it funny how committed they are to this arrogant, overbearing persona. I think the vocals here register more as an element which adds personality and atmosphere 
rather than an instrument which adds melody. Interesting to note that live, Diener often trades off vocals with Giener during the second and third sections. They may have done so on the album, but honestly it's not so easy to tell. <laughs> if anything, the guitar is far more melodically essential to the tune than the vocals are. Throughout the song, Diener throws in lots of slow, distorted, verbed out, delay ridden, dare I say, Adam Jones-esque bends, which add a lot. I mean, this did come out the year before Opiate, though, so... Tool are plagiarist tax confirmed? Not a lot to say about the lyrics on this one. I mean, other than the fact that it does contain what's probably the greatest lyric in the history of recorded music. This. I will say, though, that it's very charming and funny knowing how obsessed Aaron and Mickey were about making so many songs about some random horse they saw. I also think it's neat that the perspective and tone sort of changes with each entry. Like, this one's very menacing sounding, and it's from the perspective of a very angry, petulant, zealous stallion. Part 2, he's a little more cocky, arrogant, and goofy. And in Part 3, the stallion seems harder to define. He's eccentric, but he also seems more mythical and powerful. Production. Or lack thereof. Ha <laughs> ha. I mean, it's the pod. What else needs to be said? Well, I'd like to say that what Gene and Dean did with the way that this album sounds is more commendable than many would give credit. Fans of both the band and this record have a fair grip on this, but anyone who has listened to just this one song will know that the sonic picture that they paint is, if nothing else, unforgettable. But I would also add that it's immersive. It truly feels like a different world that I've entered with the way that everything is warped and manipulated. The layer of crud that's over top just about everything, but especially the vocals, the distortion, the disorientation they managed to create with only four tracks. This song is thoroughly, disgustingly, listener discretion warrantingly, parental advisory needingly, generation definingly, toilet fillingly, brown. <laughs> In fact, I would go as far as to say, off the top of my head, this is the brownest song in Ween's official studio album discography. Well, let me correct myself. It's the brownest song in their official studio album discography that's still actually good. Because sure, you can say that something like Morning Glory is browner than this. But that sucks. This track could very well be beyond the point of tolerability for most listeners. Honestly, I'm kind of shocked that it's not past that point for me. It's very crass, abrasive, and though it is a song, it's not the most tuneful piece of music out there. It's kind of a blueprint for something I typically wouldn't be into, at least not at first. What makes it work, for me, are the elements that I've mentioned. The interesting sonic textures, the sparse, hypnotic beat, the enticing dissonance, and the fact that it's about three minutes. Seriously, I could see this one being a lot less likable and effective without its brevity. There may very well be a super long live performance of this somewhere, but from what I've seen, they typically keep this one pretty short, and I think that's a pretty smart move. Like, sure, do I love that there are so many different live versions of Poop Ship Destroyer, many of which go on for a very long time? Yes. But do I regularly jam out to the 26-minute version? No. You thought I was going to say yes! I would be remiss to not mention that one Mr. Claude Coleman Jr., legendary drummer, survivor of at least one horrific car crash, reject of Chef Aid, and longtime member of Ween, has said that this is one of his absolute favorites of theirs due to how representative it is of them. I'm not here to make a case that it should be one of anyone's favorite or least favorite tunes, but I think Claude's words ring very true. In songs like this, Ween created something that stands alone in its style and mythos. Nothing else sounds like Ween operating at this level of brownness, unless someone makes something that's purposefully trying to copy it. Sure, you can trace things back to some of their influences at work, everything from Devo to Butthole Surfers, but this thing that they do is completely and totally them. 
In a world that is swiftly approaching a point where any and all art is synthesized and replicated via formulas and algorithms seen through by inorganic means, I will forever value and cherish an album like the pod, where not only can you hear the creativity and experimentation and human desire to express oneself, but you can also hear the mistakes, the laughter, and the bond between two brothers from different mothers through music. Thank you for watching.